Well, I want to welcome everybody for coming out this afternoon. It's a beautiful day, and so thanks for taking the time to come out here in Charleston. This isn't your uh, probably typical kind of educational seminar that you get in Charleston every weekend, right? So I uh, thank you guys for being open-minded and uh, being, you know, open to the thought of legal uh, medical cannabis. As I get into the seminar, you'll see that I call it cannabis. Sometimes I call it marijuana, but we really do try to refer to it as medical cannabis. Uh, we're really trying to change the perception of how people see marijuana and uh, get them to understand that it really is a medicine and it's actually helping millions of people every day. And so uh, my name's Caprice Sweat. I'm the founder uh, and CEO of Medical Cannabis Outreach. Um, we're an outreach uh, organization that travels around the state of Illinois giving seminars like this. We were in Champaign a couple of weeks ago, um, maybe last weekend, I do so many, I can't remember, but we had 72 people come out in Champaign. It was a record amount. And uh, this is a pretty good turnout too for Charleston. I didn't think we'd even have this many people. So uh, people are curious, people wanna know. Uh, people aren't even aware that it's legal in Illinois, uh, let alone that 24 dispensaries are open right now. And they are, uh, the state of Illinois sold $1.2 million in medical marijuana last month. So it is helping people. Uh, they've been open dispensaries for three months around the state. Uh, nothing has hit the press, anything derogatory. People are using the program properly and that's what I'm gonna talk to you today about. One of the reasons though that I do this is that um, really in a, it's based in what our mission statement is, what my mission statement is. I, I'm on a mission of compassion for people. And the reason is is because for so many years, I had to lie about my marijuana use, and I had to uh, give up relationships, jobs, doctors, and everything else to be well, to stay well. And so um, I decided, especially living in Colorado as long as I did, and this Illinois program got ramped up, that I really wanted to help the people of Illinois who were scared to have a voice or didn't know how to have a voice. So I decided to get out here and be honest about what I've been doing. I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease when I was 17 years old. So this year will be my 33rd year having Crohn's disease. I stopped taking all of these medications. This is what I'm supposed to take on a daily basis. And I stopped taking them uh, 25 years ago. Now I do when I go to the doctor and they want to give me prescriptions, I let them give me prescriptions for my prop bag, but I don't take them and I don't use them, but I do use them for my seminars. Um, but this is what I'm supposed to take every day. 25 years ago when I was a young mother, um, I was so drugged out of my mind, I couldn't think straight, I couldn't uh, participate in my little kids' lives. And I started using cannabis in Colorado and several doctors encouraged me to keep using it and to try to lessen these. Well, the next thing I know by the time I was 25 years old, I wasn't taking any of these. And now I'll be 50 this year and I still don't take any of these. I daily uh, medicate with cannabis. Um, as you can see, I, I'm pretty healthy looking for ha someone that's had a debilitating uh, disease for 33 years. And I attribute that to the cannabis and not that bag of pills. Because if I would have been taking that bag of pills for the last 25 years, I know there's no doubt I'd be uh, addicted to narcotics right now. I, I'm, I'm convinced of that. How can you take that many pain pills for that many years and not get addicted to opiates? So um, that's why I'm on a mission. We also get out, we do fundraisers, we do a lot of community outreach, we help people, veterans, and people who are disabled that can't get on the program. We help raise funds to help them uh, gain access to the program. So I'm literally on a mission, cruise around the state. I've done probably about 30, maybe 40 of these uh, seminars around the state. And uh, so what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna roll through this pretty quick about the rules and the laws. Uh, about the current research and kind of where cannabis is out right now in the United States. And then we're gonna talk about how you can get on the program. We're gonna talk about doctors, the law. We have Dan Lynn with, uh, he's the executive director of Normal is here with us today. He's gonna stand up and talk for a few minutes uh, about legislation and where the medical marijuana law is right now. It is a pilot program. So he'll talk a little bit about that, how politics and uh, the law has gotten involved with uh, patient care and medicine and how interesting that is for those of us in the industry and for patients unfortunately get caught in that pinch. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, 
so anyway, but I'll get you out of here pretty quickly. I, I run through this pretty quick. Now, the name of the program is called the Illinois Compassionate Use of Medical Cannabis Pilot Program. That's the actual name of the act, the law. Governor Quinn cited in January 1st, 2014. As most of you know, he was coming out of office as Rauner was coming in right around the time that it was signed into law, and that got all uh, kind of messed up. Uh, so essentially, it's been in law for two years. However, dispensaries just now legally opened November 9th. Um, a few dispensaries around the state opened. And every day we see more and more coming online. And like I said, your closest dispensary will be in Champaign, and that will be Phoenix Botanical. And I'm going to explain a little about that group and uh, when they're looking at opening and things like that. We're out here outreaching because about the time that I would get you guys approved to the program will be about the time that they'll be opening. So it's kind of a good thing we're in the area at this time. Um, because what we do is not only educate, but we get people signed up for the program. A lot of the people that are approved to the program came through medical cannabis outreach. We charge the patient nothing for our service. But some things I want you to know about the program, some of the rules and regulations. In order to get on the program, you have to pay a $100 fee. If you're on disability or you're a veteran with a VA medical record, it's $50, your annual fee. Okay. You also have to be fingerprinted. If you have a felony, talk to us. Uh, we have a good idea of what kind of felons get through and what kind of felonies do not. Um, if you have a big drug felon or some kind of a violent felony, whether it's 30 years old or 10 years old, you will not be able to gain access to the program. Uh, but do talk to us, please, about that. Um, and so that's a couple of the, the rules right there as far as you have to apply, you've got to pay to get on the program, you do have to pay for a fingerprint as well. So let's say you're just a regular Joe, $100 to get on the program. Fingerprint costs anywhere between $55 and $65. So it's going to cost you about $165-ish to get on the program. Now, my organization, what we do is we hold your hand through the whole process because you have to t turn in a picture. You've got to get that fingerprint. You have to do this and that. few hoops. We have it down to a science. So tell your family and friends when you leave here today, we're here. We're not here just today. You guys got my card. You can call us anytime, and we'll set up a time to meet with you or your family, your friends. We'll get you on the program if you have a qualifying condition. So let's talk about that. When you guys get ready to leave here, I'm going to give you a packet. You can share with your family and friends. You can take it to your doctor. But in that packet is the list of the uh, 39 quali medical qualifying conditions that the state of Illinois said, yes, if you have this diagnosis, you can get on the program if you meet these other requirements. So you have to start with that. Do I have a condition on the list? Now, a lot of the biggies, of course, are cancer, glaucoma, Parkinson's, Crohn's disease is on the list, lupus, uh, muscular dystrophy, ALS. Um, I think I said MS. Uh, so, you, you know, uh, some of your bigger biggies, AIDS, um, Alzheimer's, fibromyalgia is on the list. Um, so, but like I said, there are 39 conditions. So check that list out. If you have a condition, and uh, you want to try to get on the program, we can get you on the program. However, what I like people to be aware of is that in Illinois, uh, it's stated right in the law, it says that the physicians are the gatekeepers of this program. And what that means is that doctors uh, must give you a recommendation for cannabis. Uh, doctors do not prescribe medical cannabis. They recommend it only. So it's not something where they would write on their prescription pad, um, I give Bill a prescription for cannabis. What it is, in fact, and we provide these forms uh, all day to doctors. I have one right here. If anyone wants to take one today at the end, we can give you these to take to your doctor. It's a form like this. Uh, the doctor actually fills this form out. It's five pages. He marks some boxes, he or she, and they sign. And basically what they're attesting to is that cannabis uh, they're recommending that cannabis could be beneficial to you. So they're not getting, you know, they're not really holding it to anything other than I'm recommending that it might be. Now they take this form and they mail it into the state. They can't fax it. They can't email it. They can't hand it back to you for you to take to your doctor. It must go in the mail to the Illinois Department of Health. Okay. When the Illinois Department of Health receives that, once we know that a doctor is on board and going to recommend for you, at that point, Medical Cannabis Outreach, we can get you on the program. We get the application process started. Because I'm going to tell you what, the toughest part of this program is getting a doctor to say yes. Okay. So we do have cannabis-friendly doctors. 
that uh, around the state that are willing to see you. Um, it's not a situation where you go once and they're going to sign off of on it. You're going to have to go uh, several times and uh, begin a relationship with these physicians because uh, by law they need to do it right and that's the right way to do it and that's the way the law set out. And speaking of that, whoops, uh, pardon me, with this program, uh, that's why we encourage everyone also to follow the rules and the laws of the program. If you do get on the program, be very careful with your cannabis. You'll want to keep it sealed up. When you leave the dispensary, law enforcement is not setting outside of the dispensaries, okay? They've been open three months now. We know what's going on. They're not setting out there. They're not pulling people over when you come out of the dispensary. But be wise. Uh, keep your medicine sealed, just like you would if you left the pharmacy. You're not going to pop open a thing of painkillers and, you know, well, I hope not anyway. But, you know, try to keep it, keep it cool. Be smart about it. Keep it away from kids. Keep it away from your pets, okay? We don't want to hear any kind of an overdose situation from children or pets or anything. Now, on this program, the state did set out a limit that you're allowed. So, as most of you know, there's dry flower marijuana pot weed bud. All right, that's what we call it, right? So, the dry m cannabis, um, the state allows you to have two and a half ounces every two weeks. So, essentially, five ounces a month. Now, a lot of you go, wow, that's a lot. It is a lot. It's a lot. We were surprised in the beginning, but why this makes sense is because the state allows you to cook with your cannabis. So you're able to go ahead and purchase your cannabis up to two and a half ounces every two weeks, and you can make your own can of butter and oils and things like that. So, um, uh, uh, you know, and basically your can of butter because you can cook with your cannabis. So a lot of... Uh, um, there are a lot of cookbooks out there and things online that if you do get on the program and the dispensary Phoenix Botanical, those guys will be great with helping you how to guide you to uh, the resources. Uh, they may even, uh, a lot of dispensaries I know are carrying um, the butter makers where you make cannabis butter in a, a machine. Um, and so those are, uh, you know, quite popular I know around the state and people are making their own edibles, their own cookies, their own, anything you can make you know, you make butter, so anything that you can make butter with, you can make an edible out of it, okay? We'll talk about edibles here in a few minutes, too. But basically, uh, the state tracks that when you go into the dispensary, so they know uh, if you're up to your limit, there's a fail-safe built in, so you're not going to be able to purchase over that amount by accident. Uh, the point-of-sale system will stop you from going over your limit. Now, when we get to flour or to concentrates, uh, the state system will uh, deduct off of it. So, for example, if you buy uh, one gram of a chocolate, it's going to deduct like 25 grams off of your total two and a half limit. Okay. So the dispensary will be able to help you with that. They're a little. They'll be way more in tune than I am on that. But I want you to understand that that the concentrates, because it is called concentrates, they are much more uh, heavy and they're much more potent, um, rather than it taking off just a gram of marijuana, it equates to much more than a gram of marijuana. So be aware of that, okay? Now, after every two and a half, uh, after every two weeks, your time clock flips over, okay, and renews. So a lot of people ask me, especially that are new to cannabis, they say to me, well, I don't have the money to go in and buy two and a half ounces. It doesn't mean that at all. You can go in and buy a gram. Okay, one day, a gram the next day. You just can't go in and buy anything over two and a half ounces in a two-week period. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? So that's one of the laws. Another rule that I like to mention is that you uh, can only pick one dispensary. Okay, so you can only belong to one dispensary. Now, you can change dispensaries, but you can't belong to more than one at a time. All right, uh, now... I know that Phoenix Botanical is going to be the best dispensary in your area, especially you guys out here, you don't have a whole lot, but there will be dispensaries around you as the year continues on here. Phoenix Botanical though, uh, and I'll get into them a little bit more, they're going to be able to really give you excellent patient care and help you with your condition and what strain may work best for you and what way to administer it, whether you would be smoking it, vaping it using edibles, oils, that type of thing. So you'll really want to use the dispensary staff for uh, helping you because those of you that have used cannabis maybe for years, 
Um, it, this isn't 1970 anymore, okay? There's a lot of new age, cutting edge things going on in the cannabis industry, okay? This honestly, medical cannabis is honestly the safest, cleanest medicine on the market right now. And, if, and I want you all to think about that and take that home with you and think about every pill bottle that you have and you pull out the paper that they gave you with it. You know the papers when you go to Walgreens or wherever and that thing's that long with all the side effects. With cannabis, it's not that. Very clean, very safe, little to zero, little to no side effects. Okay, so think about that uh, when you're talking to family and friends. We also get into a lot of advocacy. We advocate, obviously, I'm a walking testimony for medical cannabis. So we advocate for people every day to maybe take a look at it, uh, you know, and uh, take a look at maybe trying to work with their doctor to get off of some of the narcotics. Now, the state of Illinois does allow us every six months to petition the state for more conditions. So those of you that maybe have seen the news in the last few weeks, we had a disappointing blow again. Um, Last year, we petitioned 11 conditions. And what happens is people come together, they do a petition process, and, um, and a medical advisory board, which consists of medical professionals, doctors, uh, patients, and things like that, recommended to the Illinois Department of Health that these 11 conditions should be added to the list, okay? Uh, the Rauner administration, who oversees uh, the medical cannabis program decided to deny all 11 of those conditions, PTSD being one of them. Um, and that was over the summer. Again, we put up eight more conditions. We waited another six months. And just two weeks ago, he denied again all eight conditions, PTSD being amongst them. Uh, 22 veterans a day kill themselves every single day in this country, 22. The medicines that they're given for PTSD has, have a black box warning. And when you leave here, Google everything I tell you, okay? Because the, I'm not just spewing info up here. And we should all be concerned about it. Black box warnings on prescription pill bottles. Uh, they're the most deadly medicine, I hate to even call them medicines, the most deadly uh, drugs on the market, uh, on the legal market. Uh, so not only veterans have PTSD, a lot of civilians have it as well, but um, they're given the antidepressants, and one of the top side effects is suicidal tendencies. So, of course, not only they have PSD, PTSD, then you're throwing in something with suicidal tendencies when they could be using medical cannabis that has no suicidal tendencies. In fact, does anybody know how many people have died from medical cannabis? No. Zero. Not one overdose death. Not one. Ever. Impossible. We know some people have tried, right? Don't lie. We all know that guy in college or wherever that couldn't get enough, smoking, 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 smoking. You can't die from it, okay? Now, edibles. I do like to mention this in this because that's so different now, edibles, and they're so potent that when you do get on the program and you have access to edible, edibles and concentrates, I, those of you guys even that have smoked for 40 years, you got to go into those slow and easy, okay? Because it's a different kind of feeling. And you may not feel anything for a little bit. Next thing you know, you've overdone it and then you're asleep for 12 hours. Uh, now, you're not going to die from it, but you want to be aware that you might zonk out for quite some time. So um, one lady told me, she goes, well, I haven't slept in 10 years, so maybe that's not too bad. I said, well, yeah. So anyway, uh, but you'll get a good night's sleep, that's for sure. So anyway, uh, you can petition. Anybody interested in that? Check us out on Facebook. We have a big social media following. We get into petitioning and advocacy and uh, we did a big rally down in Springfield and things like that. So we get into a, a lot of that to help the patient. This I like to explain about the cultivation center because people aren't really sure what happened here in the state, how it's set up. But the state allowed um, 21 cultivation centers approximately uh, to grow the medicine. They had to go through a big process. They won awards and they are, there are cultivations centering around in Delavan. I believe Effingham, I think, has one too. Um, anyway, they're sitting around you. You don't know it because they don't have big pot leaves, flashing signs saying, hey, we're growing marijuana here. Very discreet, so safe, safer than the Walgreens, safer than the bank, okay? Safer than the Iran nuclear deal. This thing is tight, okay? You can't get in there. So uh, extremely security and tight. So the cultivation centers grow the medication. They in turn then sell it to the dispensaries 
who then sell it to the approved patients. So you can't go in the dispensary unless you've been approved to the program, okay? Uh, you cannot gain access into... Now, a lot of dispensaries in Phoenix Botanical, actually, most of them do have a public access area where you can walk in and ask a question or get a business card or get a brochure or something. But uh, you would not gain access to any of the medicine rooms without your valid ID and your valid Illinois card. Uh, keep in mind, like I said, you pick one dispensary once you get approved. And if you do want to change later, it's a simple change form and it doesn't cost you anything. So you can change, but it takes a couple days for that to go through through the state. Okay. So cultivation center to dispensary to patient is how the, the process works. I also like to mention here, if you do have a CDL, you cannot get on the program or you have to give up your CDL. If you're active law enforcement, firefighter, or a bus driver, you cannot get on the program. Even if you get on the program and your workplace policy says no THC, workplace policy will trump this program most of the time unless you get into a big legal fight, okay? So keep that in mind, that even if you get on the program, that if your workplace says we test for THC, you, your, your employment still could be in jeopardy even though you're on the legal program. You cannot go over state lines with your medication right now. Medical cannabis is a Schedule One drug. It sits right beside heroin and LSD, things like that. So because of that, even though the states, uh, almost half the states have a medical, legal medical marijuana program, we still cannot travel over state lines or get on an airplane with our medicine. Um, there's a big push right now, you know, federally. Normal does a lot of stuff. Uh, a lot of big groups try to push federally to get it to where it's not a Schedule One drug because then the universities could really uh, study it like it needs to be studied. We need science to get involved in cannabis, okay? Uh, we need it for future generations, all right? Because we need to know if it can help cure cancer, kill cancer tumors, we need to know that. We have the right to know that. So a lot of you probably aren't aware, and maybe some of you are, that the U.S. government has a patent on medical marijuana. They actually have a patent on it, um, yet they keep it a Schedule One drug, which means that it has no medicinal value. So as all of us know, the government's a little wacky, and there's another way that it's wacky. No medicinal value, yet they do have a patent on it. Phoenix Botanical, let's talk about them a little bit. This is uh, a great group of people. They uh, came together and decided to try to win uh, dispensary licensing in Champaign. And uh, they went through, they had to jump a lot of hoops. This program has been going on, you guys, for a couple of years, like I said. So a lot of us have been in the industry and uh, this group, they've been really been working for a couple, two, three years. Uh, just It's been behind the scenes, uh, but day and night, trying to do anything they can to get these facilities open. A lot of regulation they've had to go through. Um, but Phoenix Botanical right now, they're in the middle of uh, build out and they will be opening, uh, we hope sometime in March, I don't have an exact date yet, but do watch the press because as they get ready to open, it will get quite a bit of press that they're about to open because they'll be the first one in the area opening. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Keep an eye on our Facebook page. Uh, they have a Facebook page and web page. So uh, please keep an eye on that so that you know when they are opening. They're, they'll be located at 1704 South Neal Street, Suite C, there in Champaign, okay? And uh, on their Facebook page as they, and their web page, as they get ready to open and things, they'll have their hours on there and all of that. So hopefully you guys will come through me to get approved to the program. About the time you get your card, they'll be opening and it'll be a wonderful thing. You can get legal medical cannabis, which all of us, should have the right to, okay, to safe legal medicine. So um, the Phoenix team though, I want you to use them when you get on the program, really use them for your needs. One of the things I like to explain to groups in Illinois is that because of the way the law was set up, we're in an interesting place right now, you guys in history. I, I really want you to understand that and take this away with you. Uh, not only is this the first one of these seminars in Charleston ever, that anyone's ever attended. But those of you that get on the program here in Illinois, uh, unlike California, Colorado, and the Western states where it's much more free how they handle things, here because we're regulated, this program is uh, very uh, medical, obviously. And the dispensaries are very medical. We want to know what's happening to you medically. In the Western states where it's free, they're not gathering data like we want to. So. We're gonna want you guys to tell us. You'll be the first people, really, 
some of the first people really in the world who are participating in gathering data on MS and a certain strain of marijuana. Uh, uh, Parkinson's, uh, seizures, uh, Crohn's disease, what did it do for me? As a collective, together as a state, and the residents of the state, we actually will be some of the first people to gather this data. We're in 100 years, it's going to make a big difference. It's really going to matter. And it could be life changing. Like I said, if there's any chance, this much of a chance, that cannabis could do something for cancer patients, that it could kill a tumor, it could stop it from growing, our grandkids, our kids, we have the absolute, uh, we must okay, find out for them. And we have to drop away fears and stigmas and quit this crap about the ch Cheech and Chong and all of that feeling that what, video, what TV and film portrays. I'm the face of medical cannabis, not Chong, okay? Chong's a TV guy, right? Okay, so in theory, I'm just like you guys. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. We wouldn't ask feedback from people. The, the, we only gather data from people that are on the program. They, oh, yeah. Yeah, but if they have a condition that isn't approved and you want to gather data, can we they don't. provide that anonymously? Because, in effect, they're admitting to consuming the medicine illegally. Absolutely, and people have been consuming medical cannabis illegally since Prohibition. Yeah. Um, and so... Uh, if you actually Google all over the internet, there are patient testimonies all over the world, people curing themselves of cancer, people uh, who have incredible testimonies. Now, I'm not saying that those are true. I'm just saying that there are millions of people that are giving their own personal testimonies in there. They are medicating illegally. It's unfortunate because they're good people. They're veterans who serve this country. They're mothers, their fathers, their aunts, their uncles, and they're not criminals. So. Uh, unfortunately, they've been pushed aside, but because of the internet and the new way of life here where people are sick of this killing their livers and their kidneys and addicting them, making them absolute zombies, uh, they're standing up and saying, we've had enough. So they are saying that they're medicating illegally. Uh, we don't deal with people who medicate illegally. We only gather data from people who are on the program and that have a condition. And what we want to see is what a certain strain of cannabis could do for you. So use, use uh, the great staff at Phoenix. Let them know what's working for you and pick their brain what they have for products and what people are saying that's working for them. Um, because it's a great way to for us all to come together and say this works and, uh, you know, and also it'll help them keep products in the dispensary that's going to work for your condition as well, if you let them know what's working for you. Um, let's do a brief, brief history of medical cannabis. Um, if you go back in time, cannabis has actually been around for tens of thousands of years. Um, in archaeology, you'll find that <laughs> cannabis seeds have been found. Uh, a, a mummy was just found frozen, and he had cannabis leaves in his mouth. They thought maybe he was using it for tooth uh, ache relief, chewing on the leaves. Um, so it goes back literally tens of thousands of years. Uh, a Chinese emperor about uh, 5,000 years ago, it was the first written word of medical cannabis being used as a medicine, and they were using it for gastronomical problems and things like that. So we know that it's been used for thousands of years. Unfortunately, in this country, we were lied to. And that's, I mean, it, it straight up comes down to that. That's just all there is to it. Um, and history shows the lies and the prohibition. In 1842, people in this country, most of your grandparents, great-great-grandparents, were prescribed medical cannabis. It was on the pharmacopoeia to be uh, prescribed as a medicine. But when hemp started to threaten oil, then what happened? Reefer madness, propaganda, and so hemp was taken away and outlawed. We couldn't use it for paper, we couldn't use it for energy, and no longer could we use cannabis for medicine anymore. And so uh, then you have generations, as you see we have generations in here, we range from different age groups that we've all been taught the same lie. And people are standing up now and saying, we're not gonna listen to it anymore. And that's where we see the evolution of 23 medical uh, legal medical cannabis states right now. This year, six more will vote. That'll put us tip us over to more than half of the states in the United States are uh, medically legal for cannabis. And w in that comes people, again, not being afraid to stand up, because I'm not afraid to stand up. I was five years ago. I, there was no way I would come out and done this. I uh, 
when I was a young mother, especially, I was at threat of having my children taken away from me and everything else. And I was encouraged to take Percocet and Vicodins every day of my life. And so uh, my children, who are now almost 30 years old, every day tell me, thank God, Mom, because we would have lost you. Either I would have been so dead by now, almost 50 with Crohn's disease. Uh, most people who've had it for 33 years or have colostomy bags or they have colon cancer. I have none of that. I've had no surgeries. I have no hospitalizations. And uh, my kids are just thankful that I wasn't a zombie and not addicted to pills. So that's where they encouraged me. My mother, my great aunt, who's 85 years old, they encouraged me to keep doing this because keep telling the truth. They know the truth. When you see a family member dying of cancer and they smoke marijuana and they're able to eat and keep their food down and sleep because uh, the chemo is killing them, you'll know and you'll realize what cannabis can do for people. So that's where you, we, we want people to just tell the truth. That's all, just stand up, don't be afraid anymore. The fear's gone, it's over with, prohibition is over. And it's over here in Illinois because cannabis is legal. Prescription drug use and misuse in this uh, country, the CDC just released a report, it's an absolute epidemic. 44 people a day in this country die of a drug overdose, 44 a day. And then you got the 22 of the vets who kill themselves. Right there you got 66 people a day that if they had safe legal access to cannabis, it could be absolute life changing for them. So uh, what we see, and the CDC said that uh, prescription drug overdose is an epidemic. So what we see is it's turned into an epidemic and we see people turning to cannabis as a safe alternative. Uh, in the 23 states where we have legal medical cannabis, you'll see always these things happen. A drop in violent crime, a drop in alcohol abuse, a drop in over dro uh, prescription drug overdose death, those three things always. And so uh, in Colorado, when their program started really ramping up, their medical program, the first thing the numbers shown were 25% uh, drop in drug over drug, uh, overdose. 10% uh, in violent crime. So not only is it good for the health of the people of the community, but it's good for the social structure. People stop drinking so much and acting like maniacs. They stop, they get off of these pills. You want people taking those pills driving around in a car? I don't, that's scary to me. So it, when the people are able to use cannabis legally, it stops a lot of that breakdown. So that's where we encourage you to all to talk to your family and friends, drop the fears and stigmas. What I want to get into real quick are the different types of cannabis. A lot of you uh, just think of cannabis as cannabis, but when you get downtown, there's two types of cannabis, sativa and indica. The hybrid is a third, but uh, really it's just the mixture of the two. A hybrid would be either sativa dominant or indica dominant. That means it's got more sativa or more indica. All right, but essentially it breaks down to it's a sativa and indica. When you go into the dispensaries and you're able, uh, legal, uh, able to legally purchase, the staff at the dispensary will help you with whether you're looking for a sativa or indica. Now some of these strains, they're called, have interesting names. I see that changing over the next few years where you won't see some of the kind of funny names that we see, Grape God, uh, you know, uh, some of them are, are goofy. But, for now, it, that's the way that it is. I think that we'll see that change. But when it breaks down the strains and their effects, sativas are more mind dominant. These people use these during the day because you're, uh, it keeps you more alert and awake. It is a pain reliever. It's activating, uplifting, increases alertness, energy, and enhances creativity. Uh, a lot of people who have done some wonderful work uh, and very artful, beautiful things have said that they've been on some kind of a sativa cannabis. Uh, because it really brings out creativity and it makes you feel overall well, mind, body, and soul. Indica, people use a lot at nighttime. Uh, it's body dominant, it's sedating, relaxing, it's a muscle relaxant. For myself, with the inflammation that I have in my colon, uh, it's essential, the indica, because it brings down inflammation and also the rheumatoid arthritis in my knees. So uh, it treats acute pain. It also, for cancer patients, essential for reducing the nausea and increasing appetite. Um, and it increases the dopamine, which makes us just feel good. Gives us a good feeling, mind, body, and soul. So that's what the current research, right now this is how it breaks down, but uh, we, we encourage you guys to look at the current research. Uh, and like I was explaining to this gentleman, look at people's personal testimonies from around the world. That's not just in Illinois, California, Colorado. Look at what they're doing in Israel. Mm -hmm. 
I just would like to mention, I read what got me interested in this a couple of years ago is, I don't know if you're familiar with Rick Simpson. Oh, yeah, but what? Absolutely. Right. I don't know if anyone else in the room was. Yeah, and, and the Rick, Rick Simpson. Simpson. Because I tell you that his testimony from the 70s and what he's been trying to do these whole years and with the government ignoring and the way that that right. site reads, it's absolutely It's amazing. It's and disgusting. people are saying they're curing, curing their own cancer. That's but right. That Rick Simpson Hempoil on the Google I really, I've I, I read it several times because it's yeah. encouraging. And so I, I'm glad you brought that up because the dispensaries, uh, the cultivation centers who are actually producing the medicine, uh, people ask me every day, will, will they have Rick Simpson's oil? And when it comes right down to it, Rick Simpson, he did an amazing thing, there's no doubt. But he's kind of branded that right now. That's a brand. They'll have something similar to that. It just won't be called rick simpson's oil for right now unless they get some licensing in on it which i think some cultivators are trying to get some licensing with them with rick Sim uh, simpson's oil but phoenix um tears and charlotte's web phoenix and tears so charlotte's web here. right uh so but what you'll see from our cultivation centers something very similar so uh we tell people that have can we have a lot of cancer patients already that we got approved to the program oils uh are just now coming out onto the market and so we encourage, you know, cancer patients to get on those oils ASAP. A lot of them go out of state to already get the oils because they're trying to, uh, and they're already noticing a big difference in their tumors or shrinking and things like that. Uh, the benefits of medical cannabis, um, the common ailments. Um, of course, one of the biggest things we hear are people have pain relief from cannabis. The minute you ingest cannabis, uh, instantly your endocannabinoid system, the receptors light up. You have a release, of, you start to feel better, right? You can start to feel hungry, you get a little pain relief, you can breathe, maybe you're a tensed up, you're in pain. Um, like we spoke about, please check out when we leave here. And, and in my book, I do have a study that I printed off for you about cannabis and cancer, uh, brain cancer, and some studies done through the uh, National Institute of Cancer, which is funded by the federal government, and what they say about bladder cancer and cannabis, brain cancer and cannabis, breast cancer and cannabis. It's amazing how it's... Uh, killing cancer tumors. So please check that out. Uh, complete anti-inflammatory. This is where people, of course, inflammation gives us most of the pain that we have in our bodies. So cannabis is a huge anti-inflammatory. So once you ingest it, uh, inflammation starts to go down and you feel better. Seizures. Uh, a lot of people, you've probably seen on TV that there are many mothers and fathers that leave uh, states where they cannot get cannabis oil for their children that are having 300 seizures a month. They give them the cannabis oil and they'll maybe have two seizures a month. Uh, so what they're called are cannabis uh, refugees, these families, and they leave to states where they can gain uh, the medicine. What a lot of people do not understand, and I ask you all to, again, check this out when you leave here. The, I want everyone to understand this. The cannabis oils that are given to these children have no psychoactive effect in them. They've taken the THC out so much there's a lot of CBD, which is non-psychoactive. There's no drug in CBD. THC down so much, there's no psychoactive effect. So these children aren't getting high. They get high when they go to the hospital. Okay, they're, that's where they're getting high. Not off of the cannabis oil. There's no psychoactive effect. Now the morphine they give them when they're having seizure after seizure, and they give them morphine, that gets them high. But the cannabis does not get them high. There are 32 minors on the program in Illinois right now. Uh, several of them are uh, you know, one I know is a nine-year-old little boy with terminal brain cancer. And uh, there are a lot of children that have uh, severe seizures. But adults have seizures as well, and this cannabis oil is really working for them. And not only seizures, but uh, the shaking with Parkinson's or the tremors. Uh, people say that when they ingest the cannabis, that the tremors will really usually cut in half or down three, four, yeah, three quarters. So uh, the cannabis and the seizures are very important. Um, Common ailments in the corresponding uh, cannabinoids. This is where the I don't get real scientific. I'm a patient when it gets right down to it. I just uh, have a great personal testimony. But if you look at what science is really doing with cannabis, it's amazing. Look at some of the studies that Israel, Spain have done. Science is really getting into it and tearing down the chemistry. Cannabis has uh, something like around 400 count compounds in it. Okay, So they're starting to identify what works for what. Well, the endocannabinoid system, which we all have, uh, wasn't discovered until the 90s, early 90s, that we have this endocannabinoid system. A lot of doctors do not even know anything about the endocannabinoid system. 
which is a little bit scary. Uh, but the endocannabinoid system, if you take a look at it, what happens is when uh, THC, the tetrahydrocannabinol, one of the compounds in cannabis, and the CBD, uh, the cannabinoid, I had that, the cannabinol, um, it, when they are in con work in conjunction together, that's where you get the medicinal benefit, okay? So this is something I like to explain to people too, that for those of you that maybe used cannabis in the 70s or 80s or for off of the street illegally, that the cannabis you were using had a THC content of about seven, eight, nine percent. The medicine that's coming out of the cultivation centers has a THC content of around 27 percent sometimes. So you guys that are old school, this is a whole different ball game, okay, a whole different thing here. Um, some guys maybe, uh, we have some vets that, you know, came back from Vietnam and they were using cannabis and they haven't used it since and they got on the program and they're like blown away by how different it is. It's completely different because it's medicinal and it's been grown in completely controlled, clean environments. It's lab tested and so it's uh, extremely clean and safe. So when you mix the THC and CBD together uh, and it hits the endocannabinoid system, that lights up and says, where are we having problems essentially? And it'll send out, you know, something to help with that inflammation or that hunger or that you need to sleep, wherever you're having problems. So that's a very brief, and I mean really brief, explanation of how it works. But uh, it gets much more scientific than that. And um, actually Normal's website has a great uh, breakdown on uh, cannabis and, and different ailments and how it works and the different compounds in in uh, medical cannabis. Types of medical cannabis and how people use it. This picture up here is very similar to how your product's gonna look, your medicine coming out of the dispensaries. They're packaged in uh, pill bottles essentially with the cultivator's logo on it. There'll be a, a label on it that tells you how much THC, what type of a strain it is, uh, anything that was in there in the lab testing, okay? And so it's gonna look like that. Here you see your candies, those are edibles. All edibles, for whatever reason, look like candies. And so it's really essential we keep those put up like you would any type of drug. But uh, edibles, a lot of times they look like cookies or candies, suckers, things like that. This is a salve there. Now right now in the dispensaries, uh, they don't have anything with a high THC like this, uh, but eventually they will. People love these, uh, they're topical for your skin and I use it for the blood spots I get on my hands for my Crohn's disease, and it'll take those away a lot quicker than any of the over-the-counter medicines that I would put on any sores. Also helps on your knees, sore muscles, things like that. Uh, this is a vaporizer. Um, for those of you that aren't aware of vaporizers, uh, really, cannabis, medical cannabis is moving away from smoking. As we all know, smoking's dangerous. Even cannabis, the carcinogens that you take in while you're smoking. So vaping or using a vaporizer, much safer. You're not taking the carcinogens in. And actually what you're doing is just inhaling a steam. So uh, it also alleviates the smell of cannabis, which is pretty pungent and makes other people maybe angry. They don't want to smell it or you're living in an apartment or something, like, but you're still legal. How do you consume? Well, you can consume through a vaporizer without that smell or it's not all smoky. It's just a steam. Much healthier, uh, much better for the environment. The vape pens, uh, much like an e-cigarette, but it has the hash oils in it. And so at the dispensary, they come preloaded. You buy the pen, it's got the oil in it, okay? And same deal, you just push that little button like an e-cigarette and it's a vapor, a steam, okay? And um, in the middle there, you've got a tincture. A lot of people love these. I myself in Colorado uh, love to take a tincture. Um, you put a drop of oil on your tongue in the morning, a lot of pain relief for many hours. It's amazing how long the tinctures will last. Some people put them in their tea, their coffee, their water in the morning. You don't get high, you, you, you feel good, but you're not high and not uh, unfunctionable. So, uh, but it, it really will take your pain away pretty immediately. Um, so you've got flour and vaping. You can vape flour, you can vape oils, but I do want everyone to be aware of the word concentrate. The reason it's called concentrate is because they've taken the plant and they've pulled the concentrate out of it. So it is much higher uh, THC, okay? So you've got your edibles, oils, concentrates. In Colorado, they have transdermal patches. Uh, California as well, other states. Hopefully we'll have them here one day. I do like these as well. They're much like a pain patch, 
minus the narcotic. Just THC and CBD slowly released uh, on a patch into your body. Makes you feel good. Uh, you're not high from it. I don't think anyone's ever gotten high off the patches. They're very uh, even dosing, uh, so you don't get high from those. Uh, but you do feel good. I love the, the patches. Uh, and the topicals, like I talked about for the skin, those really make a, a difference for a lot of people and uh, for sore knees and things like that. Um, medical cannabis, uh, this, these are edibles here, as you can see. You couldn't tell if I didn't have a picture of marijuana laying around with them. You couldn't tell the difference. If you eat a few of them, you'll know the difference. So, uh, but they'll come up, they come packaged nicely. And, and uh, but let's make sure safety first, safe dosing. If you're not sure, use the staff at the dispensary. Tell them straight off, be honest. Uh, in this industry, we're a no judgment zone and we're all about honesty, okay? Because we've already come out, we're saying this. Be honest with the staff and let them know if you've tried edibles in another state or if you've never tried them. And they can help guide you on your dosing and what maybe will work for you, okay? Um, proper storage, dry flower marijuana, uh, you're supposed to put it in a glass jar, seal it up, and put it in a dark place. It's uh, good for curing, it makes it a little more pungent smelling, and so that's, that's the best way to store it. You don't have to, but that's just a little tip for you. The risks associated with medical cannabis, I, I do like to bring this up because people who have never used cannabis before, um, when you first use cannabis, if you use too much, you could get heart palpitations, sweating, a little anxiety, a little paranoia, okay? Um, paranoia has been, I've actually read some funny articles in the last couple months about paranoia and medical cannabis, and uh, they say that once you're legal, the paranoia part kind of comes down a little bit because law enforcement makes people, when you're doing something illegal, of course you're going to be paranoid. But first-time users will sometimes, if they use too much, have some anxiety, sweating, a little shaky, and, you know, they're not overdosing. They're just uh, have never really had that feeling before, so they need to be careful. If you've used for 30, 40, 50 years, you could have some short-term memory loss. You could also use, lose taste buds um, and lose some smell as well. So uh, that's been shown that in long-term users that those have been some of the risks associated with cannabis. Other than that, as you notice, I'm not like one of the commercials we see over and over again, right? Where I tell you about the, the drug and then I go on for 40 minutes about how it's going to kill you and how you're going to have a brain aneurysm, you're going to have a stroke, you're this. None of that with cannabis. You know, it's just the truth. There is no big long list of risks associated. Like with any drug, though, there's risks of addiction. Uh, and there's been a lot of studies with addiction with cannabis, uh, whether how addictive it is. And they've compared it to alcohol, cigarettes, heroin, those type of things. It falls pretty far down on the list for addiction. Uh, cigarettes, alcohol, heroin, prescription pills, those type of things are, are quite a bit higher. But like with any drug, if you overuse, you're at a risk of addiction. So what we ask you today is uh, talk to your family and friends about cannabis. Don't be scared anymore. Prohibition is over. It's legal here in Illinois. At the end of the year, uh, more than probably what, what will we be, uh, 31, 32 states will have their own medical marijuana laws. So uh, this is, it's groundbreaking. It's the newest, safest uh, medicine out there. Patients and caregivers, your application process. I really, at the, and then I'm going to open this up to questions here in a minute. But anyone that has one of the conditions on the list, um, I can give you a form to take to your doctor. I can help you with the, uh, the fingerprint. And, um, you know, all of that, we basically evaluate people and I can tell you whether you can get on the program or not. You know, me and my staff, uh, we can consult with you and say, hey, is this right, the right thing with you? And if your doctor is just an absolute no, that, and a lot of times you guys, I'm going to tell you, a lot, most doctors want to do this. They do. They want to recommend it. But their group, the board members sitting at a board table, that group, they say no. So then they tell 500 doctors no. And it's unfortunate. So we see groups of doctors who say, even though my group told me I can't, I'm going to anyway. They go rogue on it and they go ahead and do recommendations. But if your doctor is completely against it, you know, call us, talk to us. We're always there. We can, you know, we'd be more than happy to help you out. So I am going to have Dan come up and talk before we do questions. He's going to talk to us really quick. Dan, like I said, uh, Dan Lynn, he's the executive director of Normal. 
uh, in Illinois. Normal has done great things for cannabis uh, in the United States to end prohibition. And um, they've been great with this medical program. They have pushed, lobbied, pushed, and pushed. And so it's really great to have uh, Dan here with us today. Let me get to on, on a different screen. And Dan, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Uh, so some background on myself. I was actually a personal assistant for a quadriplegic friend of mine who wasn't able to use his hands or his legs, and he used medical cannabis to treat his muscle spasms. Um, and as a side note, he actually became a quadriplegic as a result of a car accident from somebody who was... Uh, using pharmaceutical drugs and fall asleep behind the wheel. So uh, they are dangerous stuff. Uh, but my friend used medical cannabis for treating his muscle spasms, and it was much better than the uh, high levels of pharmaceuticals that he was prescribed by his doctor. Uh, at one time, I was actually arrested for having his medicine on my person. Um, so I'm well aware of the consequences of where we are now with our new law that does have protections for caregivers as well as what it took to get us here. Uh, I was arrested in 2007. I've been involved with the Illinois chapter of Normal since the early 2000s and I can tell you that it took us more than a decade to allow sick and dying people to have access to this plant material in this state. And a lot of that was because of the political uh, back and forth fighting between Democrats and Republicans in Springfield and over the course of that decade of working on this legislation and working on this issue, every time we were not able to pass this bill into a law, we went back to the drawing board, we made certain compromises, we made it more palatable for the politicians to be able to vote for this, uh, and eventually we got to where we are now. So yes, this program has a lot of restrictions. It's been touted as one of the most restrictive in the country. Uh, personally, I don't think it's more restrictive than New York, where you're not allowed to purchase anything that's smoked in terms of medical cannabis. Um, but in Illinois, we do have some provisions that a lot of people get upset with. One being that felons uh, with drug convictions aren't allowed to have access to this medicine. That's something that I still think would not hold up in a court of law. Nevertheless, we haven't been able to find anyone that wants to challenge it in a court of law. And that takes time and it takes money. Other aspects like allowing patients or caregivers to grow medical cannabis. Uh, that was something that we actually had in a bill that passed the Illinois Senate in 2009. We came up with about 10 votes shy of passing it in the House in 2009. And then immediately thereafter, that was one of the provisions that had gotten taken out of that legislation. Uh, another one was putting in the sunset clause or the aspect of making it a pilot program. I can directly point to the meeting where I was with a few state senators, we got the Senate President on the phone, and that was one of the provisions that we put in this, because we knew that if we can get this medicine in an experimental type of phase in Illinois, uh, it'll be very difficult for them to take that medicine away from the people who need this. Uh, and even though you'll see that people might call this program a failure online, uh, for the 4,400 individuals who now have safe and legal access to this medicine, this program is definitely not a failure. Uh, there's a lot of good things that are happening. There's a lot of awareness and education that's being taken place all over this state. And I think that moving forward, we're only going to see more people looking at this as a medicine, looking at this as a natural alternative to pharmaceutical drugs that have numerous side effects. And I can tell you that there's a lot of work that still needs to be done at the Capitol in Springfield to make this program permanent, to expand the list of conditions. Even though the governor rejected those eight conditions and the 11 before that, there is another mechanism of passing conditions through the legislature. And if we have enough votes in both chambers to override the governor's veto, we can add conditions that way. Uh, personally, I think we could have added PTSD like that this past spring. Um, immediately after we passed this medical cannabis legislation, there was a bill that not only allowed people with epilepsy to be part of this program, but also children because the original legislation did not allow minors under the age of 18 to have access to this medicine. Uh, shortly thereafter, CNN came out with a special with Dr. Sanjay Gupta, highlighting the amount of epileptic children that are benefiting from high CBD cannabis oil. And as immediately after that special came out and aired all across the country on CNN, we were able to get a bill through both chambers and signed into law with a minimal amount of resistance. 
Whereas in years before, we would have patients testify at the Capitol about how much this helped them, and law enforcement would get up there and talk about how this is an atrocity, there's no such thing as medical cannabis, medical cannabis is the equivalent to medical crack cocaine. And then we eventually passed the law. When the medical cannabis issue for epileptic children came up, and we had a committee room with a dozen different parents with epileptic children, one of the kids had a seizure during the committee hearing, law enforcement was nowhere to be found. And if you look at who voted for medical cannabis and who voted for it, who voted against it originally with House Bill 1, and then you go and look at who voted for medical cannabis to allow these epileptic children to have access to it, it is astonishing at how much more support there is. And we can use those same roll call votes to pass more conditions in this program and override any veto that the governor is going to have trying to stop this program. Um, right now, we have lobby days scheduled at the Capitol where I will encourage all of you to come and join us. Uh, these aren't rallies or protests, more it's about showing the lawmakers that we are professional industry, that we have a right to lobby them on this issue. The next one that's coming up is February 17th. The one after that is March 2nd. We have one on April 20th, and we also have another one on May 18th. The legislative session is from January through May. Uh, once a month, we have a table at the Capitol that we set up information at. Uh, when people show up at the Capitol, we'll direct them to where their state representative's office is, where their state senator's office is. We'll give them fact sheets. We'll give them a little bit of background on how their lawmakers have voted in the past with us. And then if they want, we'll go into the meetings with them so that they can tell their elected officials how they feel. Uh, this is a way that we were able to change these laws in Illinois. This is the way that we're going to continue to improve this program. And this is how we're going to make the Illinois Medical Cannabis Pilot Program both a permanent program as well as a program that respects the medicine as well as the rights of patients because right now there's a lot of rights from the patients that are being compromised, specifically not allowing CDL drivers to have access to this medicine, firefighters, EMTs, police officers, and those are one of the groups of people who we know suffer from PTSD. And if we can get PTSD approved, we can neutralize all of the space of opposition that we've had in the past. So uh, we encourage you, please join us. Um, find out more information, talk to your friends and family, talk to your neighbors. The more that people speak out about this, the less fear there is amongst the community as well as the whole state. So thank you very much for your time. Caprice, thank you once again for having such an Thanks, excellent uh, seminar here today. Yeah, thank you, Dan. These guys have been incredible. Without Normal, I really don't think that we'd see this program here today. And really, Normal uh, nationwide, what they've done for all the medical cannabis programs has been amazing. So thanks for having us, Dan. Let's give Dan a hand. I thank him for coming out here today, all the way out to Charleston. So that's nice. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and open it up to question and answers. If you guys have any questions, um, I can also kind of help. If you have questions about the dispensary, I can answer some of those for you as well. We'll see where we go. Yeah. Yes, uh, I'm dealing right now with a dispensary at, uh, well, I haven't been, had access yet down in Southern Illinois. Okay. Compassionate care. Sure. Down there. And uh, I've already, the first application was 80 bucks. The doctor in the next visit is going to be 180. Yeah, you're going through a situation where um, there are some groups in the state who will attach to some physicians who or maybe charging for visits and things like that. We're a lot different medical cannabis outreach. We're really patient focused. So our physicians don't charge and we don't charge for the application. Oh, yeah, they're helping the, the application fee. process for free when these other people are charging about $150 to do the all application. Of, all of my medical records are with the VA. Oh, so you should only you should only pay fifty three dollars, sir, and a mm -hmm. and a and a fingerprint. And person. you don't have to go see a doctor if you're a VA. Right, if you're a VA, you don't need to even be seeing a doctor. If, if you guys have a qualified condition and you want to help with the program, come and see yeah. me. And I yeah, let, talk to Eric after this because let me explain something. If you're a veteran with a VA medical record, and it's got one of those diagnoses on there of the thirty nine conditions, you do not have to have a doctor sign off for you. Okay. They've opened that up for veterans that, that go to the VA because of the federal illegality of cannabis. They say, well, we got to give the veterans some right here to it, some access to it. So you don't even need to have a doctor. Mm -hmm. When I, I just moved back to Charleston from California. Oh, okay, yeah. And I, I think what I'd like to suggest is when I Googled help with, you know, getting my application and stuff, uh -huh. you guys never came up. Mm. I ended up paying almost a thousand dollars to this guy down in 
southern Illinois, probably the yeah. same place he's going. It was very frustrating. Yeah. Wow. And now I'm hearing this going, oh, I could have saved my, my mother yeah. my money. Absolutely. Glad I'm we don't have free. the money that these guys have to put into the... Right. That's why we don't we don't come up on a first Google search. It costs like $15,000 yeah. or something. No, yeah. I get that. But if there's another way that you guys can do more stuff on Facebook... Tell or, people. Yeah. We, we tell people here, and you guys tell your doctors. Those yeah. doctors are on board. This is where we're actually well, quite Well, plus you have to think about the time that you have to be with the doctor. I mean, that's what's different about California. Is sure. I walked in, got 60 bucks, I'm done. Yeah. Like here, you have to wait the 90 days. And well, that's some... Um, uh, um, we Look, the law reads like this, that uh, the, the physician and the patient have to have a bona fide relationship. Now, Dan, you can explain this pretty well. They left that open-ended for a reason. They left it vague. The politicians in Illinois were absolutely terrified of the California program. Well, of course. Uh, and, and that's where they put in so many restrictions, simply looking to avoid that. With the bona fide patient-doctor relationship language, they purposely left it ambiguous, knowing that people switch doctors, doctors move out of state, patients die, doctors die. So they wanted to have uh, a little bit of flexibility there. They didn't want to say you have to see the doctor three times, you have to see the doctor over six months. Um, right now, I think the average is you want to be seeing them for 60 days. Yeah. And they That's have to do at where... least two visits of right. uh, a, a full checkup, not somebody who you walk in the door and they already have the signature on the, the qualifying recommendation. Right. So what that did was then every each group uh, made their own policy set on that so some groups like you said it would be 90 days or and you got to do three visits in that 90 days some groups will do two visits uh, some uh, one group won't do it unless they've seen you for a year so it really just kind of depends on the group and how they interpret that bona fide and the state is going after some of these doctors that are gouging patients and promising to write a recommendation that's right because uh, in your case they should have stopped you at the, I, I want to talk to you after this. They should have stopped you right there. And uh, did you give them any money? I gave them the eight bucks up front just to sign the, uh, uh, just to get it started. Yeah. Yeah. yeah get it okay. Started. Yeah. We'll talk, we'll talk to you afterwards because you didn't need to go to a physician. You didn't even need a doctor. for you since you're a vet and it would also be 55 to $65 of fingerprint. That's it. Yeah. You don't need to see a doctor. All right. We'll help you get it, sir. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's we'll take care of you. That's what we oh, do. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, if the person has, already has fingerprints on Facebook, yeah. That's a good question. I get that a lot because a lot of people already are fingerprinted because they're in the healthcare industry or whatever. Sure. Um, and that would work as long as it is not over uh, 60 days. Did they change that? 30. 30. It might be 30. Yeah. We yeah. do it yeah. 30 days because if it takes a little longer, we have right. insurance. So 30 days. Yeah. If it's if it's under 30 days, you'll be good. Uh, but you do have to have a um, authorization form saying that you got fingerprinted for the medical cannabis. So that'd be a little iffy there because of the forms, the authorization I forms as well. Yeah, they do. And you got to have a consent form on top of your receipt with the fingerprint. That's right. Yeah. Go ahead. Having. If anyone qualifies for this program, I do, and I've got neurosurgeons and the doctors to do that. So yeah. here I am, and I basically fast forward because this is going to be a benefit for me. I know it already is benefiting me. It's just under the sure. table. Yeah. Um, my question is the cost. You're talking two and a half ounces. Yeah. It's great to hear that Champagne has something because that's an hour and 20 minutes away that's compared right. to two and a half or whatever. Yeah. Yes. But here's my question. I'm, I've got my card in my pocket or whatever, and say you go online to some of these dispensaries, some of these websites where I'm looking for the medicinal marijuana to mm -hmm. the strains or whatnot, the cost is what I'm asking, I'm yeah. curious about. Say I've got the card, can you go, do you go on a website of any sort? It looks to me like that you can reserve what I'm seeing with your number that you get from your medicinal card, and then you basically can just go and pick it up, but there's no cost. So my question, I guess, with all that said is, I've got my car and I'm driving the champagne right now, mm -hmm. and I want to, two and a half ounces to save my trip. Sure. How much money am I looking at if I go up there to buy basically half to like to vape with, yeah. and vape, or the other half to use as edibles? Well, uh, and that's a good question. I mean, and I'm not asking for a specific number. Yeah, because it's, it's going to be ballpark. I realize, I realize right. That. Now, I'll give you an example of some of the dispensaries in the state, what they're looking at. Uh, 
right around 400 an ounce is where you're at. A little more. That's top quality. A it's little less. cheaper than that for lesser, lesser quality. Trust me, yeah. Unless you know what's in it. Yeah. yeah. It's well, that's why I said you don't pull a big dog hair out of there, right? Uh, percent tax because it's medicine. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Also, edibles cost twice as much because it's the concentrate. So any concentrate compared to flour is going to be twice as much because you have to cook it or it is mm -hmm. concentrated. And your yeah. insurance is not going to cover any of your medicine. Right. Okay. No insurance will cover it because the federal, again, federal problems. And so. it is also tested for spider mites, proper flushing, mold. Well, like I said, once you get a gander at this medical cannabis, you've never seen anything on the street like it. There's no doubt. It's... Uh, uh, and we encourage people, get off the black market. Get off the black market, and I tell people this all the time, and they laugh a little bit, but honestly, it's the truth. When you're using the black market, you're supporting the drug cartels. We don't need those drug cartels. They kill people. They hurt people. Medical, medical cannabis programs, legal medical cannabis programs, kill the drug cartels. They hate it. And the more the United States go legal, the less we need them. So get legal. It's a great feeling when you're legal. So someone is vigilant getting this done and really wanting to start, what time frame would you be looking at? With everything going smooth, doctors saying yes? No. Yeah, let's say right now today you were all set uh, and we, we went ahead and got you processed. You're looking at anywhere from 30 to 45 days. Yeah. At the most. And is my math right? Pretty well called that about a thousand bucks a month. Like two and a half ounces. Two and a half, yep, yeah, right around there. That's yes. only every two weeks you're allowed the two and a half, so that's five ounces per month. Five ounces that's a month, huge. right. It's and like even it. the most connoisseur, right. you know, is really smoking about a quarter a week, maybe. Mm -hmm. So in a two and a half week period, two and a half ounce, or two week period, two and a half ounces, really, they did that much to eat. But, 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 but essentially what Dan's saying is that that's right. So that, that's a thousand dollars every two weeks, two and a half ounces ish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, you could be spending two thousand a month. Right. Uh, on medicine. You know, Avoid. <laughs> right. Uh, if you're going you're to allowed. your limit. And then if you're really looking to spend more, the state does allow for your doctor to That's write right. an exemption That's if they right. think That's that you right. need more than the two and a half ounces every two weeks. Right. Some people <laughs> with... The doctor uh, can write that recommendation. They can. The state approves it, it's up to the state so, approves. like this back sheet here is for if the doctor wants you to have more than two and a half ounces every two weeks. Now, we haven't actually seen one, but we did see someone approach their physician about it, and it was a valid point. And what this was was we have a patient who is stage four lung cancer, and there is no way they're gonna go near smoking it or vaping it even. They can't pull anything into their lungs. So this person really wanted about six ounces a month to just make up a lot of their own uh, butter and for their own edibles, but that was a terminal lung cancer patient. So um, there might be some cases for that, but she couldn't get the doctor to do it. And, and in so. theory, if the state did ever allow for the raw juicing of the leaves, which you might see in certain parts of California, kind of like a wheatgrass shot at the health club where it's like right. a one ounce neon green wheatgrass, people are doing that with cannabis leaves in California. That's not allowed in Illinois just yet, but in theory down the road, they may embrace that. It's just a matter of how would they track that in terms of that limit from the cultivation centers to the dispensaries because the dispensaries can't have these plants in the back room where they go and trim off some of the leaves and then juice them there in front of you like they can in other states. Um, so it's one of those problems that they know exists and uh, they're trying to work it out. But that's one of those uh, also uh, reasons that you can see that that ceiling of how much you're allowed to purchase could be waived in the event that your doctor wanted to do this type of raw juicing Right. protocol with you. Right, right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Would being enrolled in the program jeopardize a person's ability to hold a, as an example, a concealed carry permit or even a FOIA card? That's a good question too. That's one of our biggest, that's one of our biggest questions. That's a great question. Go ahead, Dan. I'm not a lawyer, but this is what I can tell you from yeah. what we've been hearing. If you currently have a FOIA card, mm -hmm. they're not going to take that away. They're not going to confiscate your guns. However, if you're looking to purchase another firearm, you may be denied the purchasing of that firearm, or if you're looking to renew your FOID card, or if you're looking to apply for a concealed carry license, those will be rejected if you are a patient. It stops you right there on the application. It says if you're on the medical marijuana program, basically you can't go any further on the application. However, we know that there are a lot of people that are on the medical marijuana program that do have a FOID card and a concealed carry, and 
like Dan said, no one's had their uh, been revoked or had guns taken away. Well, it's, it's just the renewals and the purchasing of new weapons. What about the carrier? What's that? What about the caregiver? Uh, same type of situation. Same situation. How right. often do you renew a void card? Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know. It's 10 now. No. Yeah. Five or 10, I think. I think right. yeah. So that's one of those things. If you're interested in getting that concealed carry or if you're looking to purchase weapons, do that before you get enrolled in the program. That's right. Do it now before you... Because that's going to be an issue until the federal Am I understanding that right then? That if I just got my FOID card renewed, that in nine years I'm going to have to start being concerned whether or not I want to use my medical cannabis or get my... As we said today, but I bet in nine years we probably won't have this issue. Right. Yes, absolutely. Basically right now you're saying you can have a FOID card and you can have a medical marijuana card, medical cannabis. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's just really, the only times that we've heard people having issues with this is if they're looking to purchase a weapon, they already are enrolled in the program. Right. When they run your background check, that's where you'll be denied that purchase of that weapon. Right. Yeah. So. And that's just in Illinois. Now, if you went to another state that doesn't have as strict of gun laws as Illinois, you probably would be able to get that weapon, depending on what state you're in. That sounds wishy-washy. I thought that's something, something that Like I said, I'm not a lawyer. Yeah. But I'm just saying yeah. something in that doesn't make sense. Well, it's been hard for us even to explain it to people because we know that uh, people have FOID cards and concealed carries, and they're approved. They're on the program, and they're not getting those taken away. But we do know that online, when you go to apply, it says right there in red, if you're on the medical cannabis program, you can't. So you're, it's kind of a conflict. It's a little... Uh, yeah, the, the problem Strange. is that cannabis is still illegal federally. Federally. Yeah. And then you get into your federal I mean, gun that's where you run laws. Into this, uh, state rights issue. That's right. Yeah. That's why we need a federal legalization. State across the board. And that's why one of the things that I always encourage people to do is one, focus on your local community, you know, your city council, your mayor, but then also talk to your state representative and your state senator in Springfield. But then also focus on your U.S. congressman and then the two U.S. senators that we have. Because the more that they hear from <laughs> medical cannabis patients in Illinois, the easier it'll be for us to change that federal law and get these type of hiccups out of the way. Because there's no reason that somebody who has cancer should be denied access to this medicine because they have a felony in their background, nor should they be denied their constitutional right to own a weapon or purchase a new weapon because they're medical <laughs> Right, and, and travel over state lines. How it should be, it's just we need to get the federal government out of the way of that. Right, so we can travel across straight lines, get on airplanes, uh, have our insurance cover our medications, uh, have our jobs stop firing us, things like that. So we want to see be seen as uh, first-class citizens like everyone else instead of second-class citizens. Um, and so that's what Normal and Dan and, and their group fight every day, and we advocate, and we ask you guys to... Uh, you know, support us through social media, get online, share with your friends what we're doing out here. Thank you.